It is an honor for the Pew Internet Project to be presenting here. We're funded by the Pew Charitable Trusts, hence the word Pew in the title um, of the project. Um, but we're not supposed to advocate anything. We don't take policy positions on things. Uh, we're supposed to be nonpartisan, and yet we are um, empowered to, uh, to do research that we hope will be useful to people like you. And so to, to be part of the Internet uh, Congressional Caucus, uh, and especially thanks to Tim and Jerry Berman and Harry Schwartz, who have been great friends of the project. Um, and as Tim was saying, we do regular monitoring of online life, particularly what people are doing, what their behaviors are, and how they feel about privacy and security issues. And I thought today I'd give you a status report on things as a, as a setup uh, for Mr. Smith's speech. Um, this, the state of play on the Internet right now is that 68% of American adults use the Internet. 87% of American teenagers use the Internet. So that 68% that number, of course, is a lot of Americans. The Internet use is the norm in America, but 32% of American adults don't use the Internet. It's important to remember as we have discussions like this that there are large numbers, millions upon millions of people, who don't live the life that we are going to be discussing today. They tend to be older, poorer, less well-educated, uh, more likely to be African American, and more likely to be disabled. So I would encourage you to keep them in your mind as you're having discussions about this. Uh, there are seven realities about uh, privacy in this modern age that we've uh, picked up in our data and other uh, privacy researchers have picked up, and I thought I'd run through them very quickly as a, as a setup for Mr. Smith. The first is that privacy is a context-related value for most but not all Americans. Most people will disclose important parts of their uh, personal information in return for something of value, in return for something that they are getting that they think is more convenient, a great opportunity, or makes them more productive. As a way to think about the universe of Americans, uh, you can think that about 25% of Americans are privacy fundamentalists. They would prefer not to give up much of anything about themselves, and they certainly don't want to disclose anything if they're given the choice. About 10% of Americans, and it's a shrinking cohort in recent years, in part because of concerns about uh, privacy violations, but about 10% of Americans are privacy indifference. They are unconcerned, and they will give away lots of information about themselves, in, in basically for a song, and they don't much care about the implications of that. And the vast majority, about two-thirds of Americans, fall into a, a middle group that um, uh, we and others have called privacy uh, pragmatists. Uh, they will give up information in return for something of value. They care about privacy, but are, to a far greater degree than privacy fundamentalists, often willing to allow people to have access to and use of their information where they understand the reasons for its use and where they are getting something of value for its use. So that's point number one. Privacy is a context-laden value for Americans. The second is privacy means different things to different people. For some, it means anonymity. They do not want to be known except under the circumstances that they control. For others, uh, it means confidentiality. Uh, they believe it's okay to disclose their information under certain circumstances, but they want to make sure the people to whom and the organizations to whom they disclose it um, don't give it away without their permission to others. And for, uh, for another group of Americans, privacy is all about security. They will give away or allow information about them to be collected, but they want to make sure it stays in the hands that they have given it to and is not uh, violated by outsiders. The third uh, great point about privacy from uh, the modern era is that privacy violations come in different flavors to different people. The most important thing that's on everybody's mind these days is material theft of something precious to them. Identity theft is on everyone's mind now, and that's a privacy violation that ranks at the top of people's concerns. But the others are also concerned about intrusion. They don't like unwanted mail. They don't like telemarketing. They certainly don't like spam. Other people are concerned about privacy for the manipulation elements of it. They do not like organizations profiling them, maybe collecting a sort of uh, covertly information that will allow them to be marketed to in sort of sneaky and secret ways. They want things to be open and transparent. There are others who are concerned about discrimination. Uh, they are against secret standards being used for making consumer risk assessments or other decisions uh, on credit and insurance and things like that without their knowing it. To them, that's a privacy violation. Then, of course, there's always uh, the classic American concern about big brotherism. By and large, Americans don't like their government knowing lots about them. They know they understand the value of that uh, in some circumstances, but as a preference, they would prefer that government uh, not know uh, very much more than is necessary about them. 
And a final sort of flavor of, of privacy violation relates to embarrassment. People have secrets, uh, family secrets, and they would prefer not to have those disclosed just for the embarrassment or shame of it. The fourth truth about it, uh, privacy in this modern era, is to Amer that to Americans, not all information is created equal. If you think about different kinds of information, Americans put a different value on it. The most important stuff to Americans, the stuff they want to keep uh, most, most closely guarded, is health information, financial information, information about their children, and family secrets. The rest of it is sort of up for grabs, and they are willing to be in that transaction mode of, I'll give you something of value to you about me if you give me something uh, back of value. The fifth uh, reality of, the, of this era is that Americans cherish control over the, the information that relates to them. 86% of the people in a recent survey we conducted said uh, that Internet companies should ask permission to use personal information. 84% are concerned about businesses and people that they don't know getting personal information about them and their families and disclosing it without permission. 54% are not wild about tracking online, but another 54% are perfectly happy to be in this transaction mode if they are offered the bargain explicitly. The sixth truth uh, about the privacy in the modern era is that despite all these concerns about privacy, which are real and in, embraced by in online behaviors, Americans do a lot of trusting things online. So there's a paradox. As they say they're concerned about privacy, lots of them uh, will get health information online. 79% have done that. 67% of American adults have uh, given up personal information to buy something online. 62% have given up personal information to get travel information. So they're doing things that are disclosing and, and giving away personal information, even as they um, are somewhat concerned about their privacy in the online world. And the final thing, which I think in many cases uh, brings us to the current moment, um, uh, certainly in the uh, legislative life of our country, is that online threats to privacy have grown in recent years, and they have affected online behavior. In a recent survey we did, people said they were so concerned about spam, 29% said they were so concerned about spam that they've stopped using email as much as they used to before. Two-thirds of Internet users have had something go wrong with their computer that they can't explain or that frustrates them. Uh, the, the home page has been grabbed, the computer slows down to a crawl, they've seen new icons on their desktop that they don't know where they come from. Um, that's about 93 million people. And about 91% of, of Internet users have adjusted their behavior online in part because they are worried about these threats or they have directly experienced them. They've stopped opening email attachments. They've uh, stopped going to certain websites that they fear are, are planting material on their websites, particularly spyware. Um, 25% have said they've stopped downloading music or video files uh, from peer-to-peer -peer services because of their concerns about that. So, Here's why Americans are anxious. Uh, all those facts uh, sort of added up, add to a higher level of anxiety than I think existed 10 or 15 years ago. And as a policy matter, uh, Americans, you know, have preferences. They would like a different tilt on the privacy playing field that gave them the presumption of control over their data rather than the other way around. They would love more education that would help them understand better how to deal with the threats that they face that they sort of inherently know are out there, but they don't actually know what they amount to. They would like new, easy-to-use technology tools that give them a sense of control or at least transparency in their data. And they would really, really love to put in jail the people that do them wrong. Uh, the so that's the shape of the networked environment uh, Americans now encounter. And it is my preamble to introduce to you Brad Smith, the Senior Vice President and General Counsel of, and Corporate Secretary of Microsoft. He's responsible for all uh, the legal work for government, industry, and community affairs activities at the company. He has played a leading role at Microsoft on intellectual property, competition law, and other internet legal and public policy issues. And he has also helped spearhead Microsoft's global campaigns to bring enforcement actions against those engaged in illegal spamming, virus creation, and software counterfeiting. So he's perfectly positioned to observe the world I just described and to shape Microsoft's response to it. I'm pleased to introduce to you Brad Smith. Well, thanks, Lee. Thanks for that introduction. Uh, thank you for coming. I know this is a busy day in a busy building, uh, which means it's a heck of a lot busier than on most buildings in the planet. Uh, it's great to be here with those of you who work here on the Hill. It's great to be here with a number of other companies, HP, eBay, and others, uh, with Jerry Berman from CDT. Uh, this is an issue of broad importance to a lot of people. 
across the country and to those of us who work and create products for the Internet every day. I think Lee captured a lot of this very, very well. Privacy is an important topic. It's context specific, as he mentioned. And it reflects a lot of important cultural and social values to people in this country and around the world. Uh, I think that the cultural and context specific aspect of this issue first hit home for me uh, really 12 years ago. I had been living in London for four years, and in 1993, my wife and uh, our, our one child at that time, and I moved to Paris. And one of the things, of course, you do when you move to a new city or to a new country is you set up in a new apartment or house. You get a, sometimes a new car. Uh, and uh, you know, after about a month, you get a phone bill, something that all of us experience basically every month, uh, no matter virtually where you live in the world. And I remember you know, in our Paris apartment getting that first phone bill, and like other phone bills elsewhere, it lists the numbers that you called during the last month. Now, in Paris, every phone number has eight digits. But on every Paris phone bill, you only get to see the first six digits. And there was actually a reason for that. In France at the time, it was considered socially more desirable that you not be permitted to know exactly who your spouse might be calling. <laughs> and this had a long-standing tradition that was very much a reflection of their culture, and yet, of course, a practice that Americans might look at and have a slightly different point of view. A lot about privacy, whether we're talking about it at the national level or even more broadly at the global level, is an exercise in blending together different points of view. Yeah, I wanted to come here today, make the trip from Seattle, join all of you, to talk about our view as a company, joining a number of other companies, and really highlighting the need that we see for new, comprehensive, federal privacy legislation. Legislation that really does two things, that sets a common baseline across the country, and legislation that creates the kind of uniform standard that we think the country needs. And you probably wouldn't be surprised to hear that when I start by saying something like that or when my colleagues from Microsoft say something like that, we often hear two questions in response. The first is, why are you people calling for this? And the second is, and why are you doing it now? After all, there's been some other companies and other groups that have been calling for it for some time. We have followed this issue for a long time. We have complied with privacy laws really around the world for over a decade when we first were required to do so when a new European directive took effect. But this is the time, this is the place, we believe, for this government to adopt privacy legislation on a national basis. There's really three reasons this seems like the right time and place to us. The first is that when we look at the Internet and what it's going to take for the Internet to continue to flourish, one can't help but note the growing concerns that American consumers are expressing about the state of privacy on the Internet. Now, a recent CBS New York Times poll showed that nine out of ten Americans now regard privacy as a problem or even serious problem when it comes to their use of the Internet. And I think even more disconcertingly from the standpoint of a company whose business is based on the Internet, a recent consumer union survey showed that 25 percent of Americans said that they had stopped purchasing goods or services on the Internet because of their concerns about privacy. A lot of that you heard reflected in what Lee was highlighting about the reactions people were having even to the use of email. This is a technology that at its heart depends on retaining the confidence of the public. And as we can see, that confidence is not what it was a few years ago. The second thing we see is that in some cases that concern that consumers are expressing is in fact based on problems that are really taking place on a day-to-day -day basis. 
It's not a mirage. It's not something that can simply be overcome through better information and education. There, in fact, are real problems that need real solutions. We've all seen the accounts in newspapers over the last year about breaches to data security, databases that have ended up in the wrong hands, sometimes through just inadvertence. They were put in the wrong place at the wrong time, sometimes through actual hacks or attacks or other nefarious steps. One of the things that we hear from our customers is frankly just the problems that they face today in ensuring that data stays secure. There is one major bank that has told us that on average once a week in New York, one of their employees leaves a laptop in a taxi cab. And so you can just imagine what happens if that particular week, that particular laptop happens to have personal information that hasn't been secured. So it's not the case that consumers are out of touch. The problem is that they have, quite rightly, focused on a problem we need to address. And the third reason that we've concluded that national privacy legislation is needed is because of the collage legislatively, the patchwork of laws that has started to emerge at the state level and even at the federal level. You know, in part because of these problems, over 20 states have adopted privacy legislation. In a lot of ways, that's a good thing. And the federal government has adopted privacy legislation as well for financial institutions through GLB, for doctors and hospitals through HIPAA. That's a good thing, too. The problem is that as the number of laws continues to grow, what we find increasingly is a real patchwork. There are inconsistencies. There are inconsistencies in the laws between states. There are even inconsistencies at times between laws adopted at the federal level. And that fundamentally is not going to help us improve the state of privacy in the country. It's reminiscent to me, to some degree, of what we saw first in the 1980s, what Americans saw in the 1980s when they started looking at some new packaging that was appearing in grocery stores. There was increasing pressure. There were even some state laws that required different food suppliers to put nutritional labeling on their products. But what quickly ensued was a patchwork of requirements. So that if you were in the dairy aisle, the nutritional label looked one way. And when you went to look at frozen vegetables, you suddenly had to master a whole different description. And if, lo and behold, you actually wanted to buy ketchup on the same day, you were going to have to get the equivalent of a degree in understanding how those companies were creating nutritional labels. It was the right intent. But the effect of that patchwork of rules was something that took consumers and even the food producers backwards rather than forwards by creating confusion among consumers. The answer was legislation adopted by Congress in 1990 that created a national standard that applied to all food products so that those of us who go to the grocery store today have a far easier time picking up whatever it is that we've decided to purchase or our spouse has told us to purchase, as the case may be, and actually know what's inside it. That is where we are with privacy today. You know, we face today a situation where if you're going to a website that's hosted in California, it may be different from a website that's hosted in Washington State. Or if you're going to a website that is dealing with one type of good, it may well be different from what you see when you go to your doctor's office or you deal with the bank at the corner. We need a greater degree of uniformity if we're really going to improve the confidence that consumers quite rightly have in their ability to use the internet. So the time has come, we believe, for comprehensive federal privacy legislation. Like all such things, there are a lot of things that any such legislation needs to do and do well. And like all such things, as you all know, frankly, well better than me, there will be a lot of devils in a lot of details. And it'll take a lot of discussion and a lot of compromise, ultimately, to produce the kind of law that really will help 
continue to move the Internet forward. As we hope this discussion broadens and moves forward in the year ahead to perhaps focus on some specific federal legislation, we think there's probably four overarching principles or areas that are worth taking into account. The first is to think about what we need from a federal law and ensures that it establishes the type of uniformity that's needed. That means that a federal law really does need to occupy the field, so to speak. It does need to preempt state laws. If all we get is a federal law, so that then people have to think about 50 state laws and a federal law at the same time, we're really not going to solve this problem the way we need to. And yet it's also clear that the states will continue to play an important role, especially when it comes to enforcement. Certainly, I think as a company and as an industry, we look to the FTC as the preeminent player in ensuring that consumer rights are protected across the country. And the FTC has done that extraordinarily well in addressing issues like spam and other malicious code that we see on the Internet. And yet, no single agency can ever, I think, hope to have the resources needed to enforce the law by itself. And hence, we would say that it is right, it's useful for state attorneys general to also have a right to enforce the federal law. And even as we think about what we need for our society and our values here in the United States, it's appropriate, it's important for people here in Washington and across the country to look around the world a bit as well. One of the defining characteristics of the Internet is really that it is a global network. It's one of the few products that exist in the world today that is just inherently global in character. And if that were ever disrupted, a lot of the value that the Internet creates for people would really be undermined. And so we should do what's right for people in our country, but we should do that with an awareness of what other governments have done already and are likely to do in the future. So that we also contribute to the continued effectiveness of the Internet as a global network. So those are all parts of, I think, one of the first things that a new law needs to do. It needs to create a uniform baseline throughout the country. And then you get to, in some ways, the even more important questions. What kind of baseline, what kind of values should be reflected in a federal law? Well, we would certainly say that the second principle should really be a focus on transparency. If there is one key both to winning consumers' confidence and to ensuring that the Internet works effectively for business, it is the principle of ensuring that as consumers we know what is going to be done with our information and we know it before whatever it is that's going to be done is done with it. That really means that there needs to be a focus on providing consumers with notice. Notice about how information is going to be used. Notice that's timely so that it's provided before the information is put to use. And part of that transparency also means two other things. It means that consumers need to have the ability to go find out what information a business actually is retaining about them. That's a lot easier to do more efficiently, less expensively today with the Internet than it was 10 or 15 years ago. It is something I think that Internet-based businesses can accomplish and win people's confidence by letting them know that they're always able to find whatever information is being stored about them. And I think the last part of notice is really letting people know when things go wrong. I mean, one of the important elements of, of the bill that's being marked up today that Chairman Stearns has really led is this focus on letting consumers know when there's been a security <coughs> breach. And certainly in our eyes, if there's been a breach that has allowed unencrypted information to fall into open hands or the wrong hands, consumers do need to know that. If they can't learn in a proactive way from a business when that happens, then I think it's going to be a lot harder for us to retain the confidence of the consuming public going forward. 
So this sense of transparency through notice is the second of the four things that we would suggest a new law should include. The third is putting consumers in a position where they have greater control over their use of information, over a business's use of information. And that, of course, in this context, comes down to asking for consent. Especially, we would say, in situations where information is used ultimately in a way that's different from the manner in, for, in which a consumer was first told it was going to be used. Now, if you're asked to give information because you're buying a good and the company would like to be able to reach you on the telephone if the person from UPS can't find your address, that's one thing. But if a business tells a consumer that's the only thing that they're going to do with that information, then, I, then that business shouldn't turn around and give that information to somebody else internally or externally so they can start calling you while you're eating dinner to try to sell you something else. It's a simple fact of life that if people feel that every time they do business on the internet they lose that type of control over their information and hence their lives, their willingness to use the internet and get the benefits that it has to offer is going to be undermined. So this focus on asking for consent, on differentiating between the primary use that people may expect their information to be put and then changing that later on in any of a variety of scenarios is a third principle that needs to be addressed. And finally, the fourth principle is the one that actually is front and center here in this building today. That is data security. You know, as I said before, people need to know when there's been a security breach. But I also think it's fair to say that consumers deserve more than simply being told when things have gone wrong. I think as businesses that live and survive and often profit and flourish on the basis of the use of that information, it is appropriate for us to have a legal duty to take affirmative steps to ensure that it is protected. The law needs to be flexible. It needs to recognize that technology is going to continue to evolve and we want businesses to continue to take advantage of whatever emerges as the next wave of technical evolution. But there should be an affirmative duty to be responsible and take reasonable care of the personal information that is entrusted to us. So through those, that combination of uniformity, transparency, control, and security, there is the makings of the kind of law that would improve the state of privacy in the United States. I should conclude by also saying that there's no one I will know of in our industry who thinks that this is a panacea. There is no one, certainly at our company or any other, that has ever believed that this is a problem that government can solve by itself. We have a responsibility as industry leaders, as people who flourish on the basis of the internet, to continue to take all of the other steps that we have been focused on taking. We need to continue to improve technology so the technology itself empowers consumers. We need to work together as we are through self-regulation and industry collaboration, through new industry standards to improve the state of privacy on the internet. And like everything else in life, consumers too need to act. We can do the equivalent of putting a seat belt in people's cars in terms of the way we equip the personal computers that people buy. We can even look as we should to a law that ensures that there is that kind of protection available to consumers. And yet, as we all know, a seat belt does no good if you get in a car and you don't put it on. And so even after all of this, there will always be steps that will be fundamental for consumers to take as well. But what is interesting about this issue, like so many others, is that it's so clear at this stage that the answer in terms of continuing to move forward is that we all work together. 
that government take new steps, that technology companies take new steps, that consumers be educated so they too can take new steps. If we do those things together and we do them well, I think there's huge cause for optimism about what we can look to this part of the economy to do, both for consumers and for the creation of jobs, not just next year, but in the next decade and beyond. Thank you very much. I, think, I don't even have to invite questions here. They're already coming. Here, right here, we'll start with. How many of the bills under consideration now meet the standards that you outlined? Well, I think we're quite enthusiastic about you know, the, the range of bills that is being considered now. I think each of the bills that is being considered, including the bill that's being marked up today, will take an important step forward. At the same time, None of the bills that is being you know, marked up or, or uh, being reviewed in hearings this year does the full range of things that we think needs to be done. And so I think we should all look to this year as a year in which we can hopefully continue to take some important steps. Next year, we hope, is a year in which we can take even bigger steps by addressing this broader range of issues. There, back there. Well, it's, I, there's a lot of lessons that can be drawn from the laws around the world. You know, and certainly we're very familiar with, I, I'd probably say, all of them. Uh, you know, and you know, I think, despite my comments about Parisian telephone bills, uh, you know, the reality is we owe a lot in this country to the you know, decades, literally decades, of experience in Europe developing these principles, particularly around notice and consent. So I think that there, in the first instance, there, there are pieces from those laws that we should draw from, and that's part of what I've just described. I wouldn't replicate any of them in their entirety, in part because I think we've had the chance to learn, especially over the last five years, and I think it's appropriate that you know, our law reflect uh, the needs and, and values of people here. I do think it is important to focus a bit on what you described as the safe harbor uh, with the EU. Ultimately, I think it would be far preferable to have a law in place in the United States that would more easily enable businesses in the United States to take advantage of the current EU safe harbor, both so data can move into the United States and at times so data can move elsewhere. Uh, especially given the global nature of the Internet and so many other computer networks, uh, we probably do need that in a fairly significant way uh, and in a way that we don't have today. You know, when I look at the, the state laws today, they are a cause for heartburn but not because any individual state has gone off and done something that just seems like a really unwise thing to do. The cause of the heartburn is that, not surprisingly, each state is inclined to do something a little different from the other states that have acted before it. And so it's the patchwork of state laws that is creating heartburn, not the uh, individual laws that are emerging. I think that's a very good question, and, and frankly, it's one that's going to need a lot of real thought and discussion here in Washington. I mean, ultimately, it is not going to work if industries are subject to dual regulation. Uh, you know, so, you know, especially given the, you know, the sensitivity of people around their money and their health, you know, two of the most sensitive things in, sensitive things in people's lives, and you know, we've got federal legislation today. We would suggest that we need to find some way to create you know, uniform uh, regulation so that banks and hospitals and doctors are not trying to comply with two different laws. The best way might be a single new law that takes the field 
at the federal level as well as at the state level. But look, you know, the, we do not have all the answers. We certainly don't have all the answers today. Uh, you know, so there are some other people in the room who've, who've thought about some of these issues longer and harder than, than we have. Uh, and there's some people who are going to be very directly affected that absolutely will and should be part of this dialogue speaking for themselves. I don't know, Jerry, if there's anything that you would add on, on that perspective. Well, I think, I think it would be, it's important that we, that we try and figure out whether there is an overlay that we can, that, that would create a common standard across these, these, uh, these different areas. Um, totally getting rid of the sector, well, the different sectors would be, I think, a monumental task. But when you look at all the different sectors, they really do come up with the same kind of common principles that you that you suggested when you have laid out for you in this speech. So I think that there's a way to work with the principles so that there's not an inconsistent regime, even though you may have slight variations. Yeah. Well, that's a good point. Having lived here 20 years ago, I'm both impressed by all the monuments in this city, and I have an appreciation for how difficult it is to build new ones. So, you know, it, one should be cautious about taking on monumental tasks. I think that's good advice. Uh, the CP common principles should be most conservative and the highest common denominator be applied across all states. For example, comprehensive opt-in versus opt-out. How do you judge commonality? I think there's a couple of factors that need to be uh, really considered in thinking about, you know, where one sets the bar in various areas. The first is, is the, the point that Lee made at the outset. Context matters. So I tend to suspect that the bar should be set to some degree at a different level depending on the context. Uh, and that, and frankly, part of what will be needed as the exercise here is to first define the different contexts that do matter. Yeah. If we have some common understanding about the scenarios that are most important, it gets to be a lot easier to then talk specifically about what the bar should be in that in a particular context. I think if you try to set the same bar for every context, we're probably back to the realm of taking on tasks that may be too monumental uh, to be feasible. The second thing is, and it's something that is said all the time and is said in such a general way that you can't really disagree with it, but it still is important, is that I do think you need some balance. Now, if you go to the absolute highest possible threshold or to the lowest possible threshold, either way, you'll have probably erred. I mean, it is remarkable, I have to say, just from uh, the perspective of somebody who works in, in this industry, to see how rapidly transformed uh, the business models are with respect to web services. Uh, and so consu and consumers are reaping a huge amount of value out of that. You know, new services are being offered. People are able to take advantage of them for free uh, because they're being supported by advertising, and that advertising, in turn, is absolutely dependent on some aspect of the use of personal information. And if you set the bar all the way at the top, you could, in a stroke of a pen, you know, eliminate a lot of services that people really appreciate being able to use and use for free. And at the same time, I, I actually think one thing we have to recognize is that when there is a decline in consumer confidence, and to some degree, I'm not confident that people even fully appreciate all of the uses to which information is put. There's a real vulnerability that can be created, and that needs to be addressed as well. And so you need to really figure out how to draw that line in the particular context in a way that balances both of those things. Uh, over here, sorry. Well, in some sort of following on in a similar vein, there'll be some states where consumers may enjoy what people might say is a very high standard of privacy uh, under the law. And in other states, it may be lower and non-existent. If you have a federal standard, that would apply to all states. But what would be done to make sure that the people who, in particular states, enjoy a high level of privacy do not lose their privacy because of the federal law? And, and I say this in the context that there may be some, in, uh, some elements of industry which may not want to uh, provide consumers with 
robust Well, it's a it's a good point. My reaction would be, look, we in the business community have a voice, and we're given the opportunity to exercise it. Consumer groups have a voice. They'll exercise it as well. You all, I think quite rightly, do us the favor of listening to our voice, but you're the ones who make the decisions. You get to decide. The people who are elected to represent the American public get to decide. And I would suggest that the best way to decide is to decide by setting a bar that people feel genuinely comfortable and confident is well suited to the country as a whole. I actually think that if you have federal legislation and yet fail to preempt the field at the state level, we're not going to do much of anything to solve this problem of having a patchwork of laws that increasingly is inconsistent. And so, you know, what that obviously does is it raises the stakes and it means it's very important for Congress to get it right. But I'd much rather have us all invest our energy in getting it right and having that be the law of the land than just adding one more law to the many laws that already exist across the land. Here you go. Yes, it's a very, very good question. Certainly from our perspective, a privacy law should apply to information both that is collected and used online and that is collected and used offline for really a number of reasons. One is data moves back and forth. Anybody who goes to a doctor's office, at least in the year 2005, still typically sees a doctor or a nurse writing down information on a piece of paper. A lot of that information moves from that piece of paper into a computer database, and frankly, you know, we're hopeful that by the end of this decade, more of it will be inputted into a computer from the start. That will improve accuracy and reduce errors. But that's just one of thousands and thousands of examples of, of instances where information moves back and forth between an offline world and an online world. Second, I think we would say that it would be better if there's the type of uniform standard that doesn't favor online at the expense of offline or favor offline at, at, at the expense of online. It, consumers will be better served. They'll have a clear understanding if, again, the same rules operate all the time and everywhere. So, you know, that in, at one level adds to the size of the challenge that Congress, we believe, should address, uh, but it would do far more, in our view, to really ensure that the American public will continue to have confidence, you know, parting with personal information. And I, and I would I'd have to say, I mean, it is very striking to me, especially when I am involved in discussions at the state level and with state attorneys general. I mean, there have been so many victims of identity theft in the past couple of years. By one estimate, 10 million victims of identity theft in the United States. And far more of those victims have been victimized in an offline environment rather than through online theft of information. So I think one would be mistaken to conclude that you know, privacy concerns are, are confined to people's use of the Internet. Well, uh, I'm not going to kid you into thinking that state attorneys general are clamoring for federal preemption of their state laws. Uh, you know, it is always a challenging discussion whenever the preemption topic arises. It was challenging in the context of canned spam. I actually think to some degree, and being a bit of an optimist, that in fact the experience of the last, I'd say, 12 months in particular, uh, have shown increasingly the important role that state attorneys general have to play in the, in the enforcement of a federal law like can spam. And so the month after the law was enacted, we heard state attorneys general and other, some other state officials expressing concern. Personally, I think with the passage of time, what we're finding is that we have a good federal law that we can apply across the country and we can turn to state attorneys general to do so. And that is increasingly, I think, working quite well. 
I think that this offers us a, a similar opportunity. I would predict that state attorneys general will be more enthusiastic about enforcing a federal law than they will uh, about having their state law preempted. But I also just think we just have to recognize reality. The Internet doesn't stop at state lines. Consumers don't stop at state lines. They go to websites, frankly, not just the websites that are hosted across the country, but, but hosted around the world. And so you know, we have to recognize that this is a technology that needs to be addressed at the national level. Back there. I, I actually think of that as being more a question of two categories rather than three, but let me explain why. First, we have certainly been focused on trying to create tools that make it easier for people to see the information on their own computer, and I think that is an important goal. Uh, and we've done that you know, over the last several years uh, in the context of things like cookies. We've done it you know, through a new program that we offer, other companies do as well, you know, to address spyware. Uh, I think there's a variety of technical ways we can continue to do more and better to empower consumers so that they know what is sitting on their PC. And I think that's a good thing and we should continue to do that. Second, I would agree that whether there is data that exists at our company or any company, and that's where I would, would put these two things together, I think it is appropriate for consumers to have the ability under federal law to see what information is being retained about them. And you know, if the law is clear and it's flexible and we're all given sufficient time to implement it, we'll be able to meet that standard. And it will be a lot, a lot easier to meet one national standard than to try to meet 50 different state standards or worse, 50 state standards and a federal standard on top of it. We're going to make that to the last question because I know a lot of people have to hustle the back to work, but both of us will stick around to answer questions okay. after this. Great. Thank you again. Okay. Oh. Oh. Oh.